Hi everyone, welcome to TSUN Digital. My name is Amy and today I'm joined by Nosa Amoigui, who is CEO and founder at Weave AI. So welcome Nosa, great to have you back. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, of course. And having finished all the events of 2022, we've had TSUN ESG and it's nice to catch up with you before the winter break as we wanted to see what you've been up to at Weave AI, hear a little bit more about what your company's been focused on and chat again about ESG stewardship. So could you just give us a quick overview and just remind us about yourself and your company, and then we'll dive straight in. Sure. Um, so I'm Noso Moig. We are um, uh, based in Seattle. We AI is an AI company uh, that does uh, data management uh, for financial services. Uh, we take in large amounts of data, um, and we have a variety of decision support uh, solutions, uh, one of which is ESG. Um, and we uh, launched last year, uh, you know, um, through the UBS competition where we did really, really well. We came second um, and, and sort of that guided us towards sort of shaping our solution for ESG. Um, and so we, the team is mostly sort of former Microsoft and Google scientists. I used to be the um, head of the AI uh, uh, platform team at Amazon. I also did a lot of work that led to Amazon Alexa, personalization systems at Amazon. And I was also at Microsoft Research, where I was uh, the head of the research team that liaised with all the four research labs on a variety of projects uh, for the company worldwide. Well, very interesting career there. So I can see how it's led you to work at Weave AI then and um, knowing a bit about your company already. Um, but just to catch up on where we are when it comes to ESG, because this is such a fast paced industry, you know, we've seen so many discussions at our conferences on where we are in terms of the data challenges and all the things around that. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing from your clients at the moment with regards to ESG stewardship and risk monitoring specifically? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, stewardship is is becoming, you know, a, a, a global standard in terms of how asset managers and asset owners hold their um, portfolio companies accountable uh, in terms of promoting better corporate governance. Um, so stewardship, um, I'll just quickly define it for those that might not be aware. I'm sure most are aware, but I'll define it anyway. Uh, it, 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 it comprises of sort of corporate engagement, proxy voting and advocacy. And the main idea is, is like I said, you know, making sure that um, portfolio companies uh, they're following good corporate governance principles. Uh, and now with the rise of ESG, that has added a new dimension to, to stewardship. Um, so one of the main challenges is that asset managers face is one of scale. Um, many asset managers have many, many thousands of portfolio companies, and they have very small stewardship teams. Uh, we've seen asset managers that have two people um, in their stewardship team. Some have five, some have 10. Um, with large, large portfolios. And, and so the challenge becomes how do you scale, you know, your stewardship efforts to make sure that you can go, you can go broad uh, in terms of your entire portfolio, but also go deep to perform the right amount of due diligence that, um, that is required. Um, and this is, you know, a critical factor. Stewardship has been, um, which is directly connected to corporate governance, um, better governance leads to better financial results. It's an alpha signal. Uh, many, many studies have shown this. Uh, it's also a competitive differentiator for asset managers to demonstrate how they are, um, you know, being good stewards of their clients' money in terms of attracting more capital and so forth, and also building building their brand. So, um, but like I said, you know, scaling it is the challenge. You know, we're, we're dealing with large amounts of data. Uh, most of which is not structured, most of which is buried in very long reports from many, many sources, what the companies are disclosing, what their competitors are disclosing, you know, other sources in the news, alternative data sources, what's in research reports, shareholder proposals. Uh, so it's a large, large problem, and that's what we help uh, uh, customers tackle. Yeah, that's great. Could you expand a little bit on those alternative data sets? Because like you say, there's so much data out there. So what are the stewardship teams specifically trying to whittle through? Yeah, so like you have, um, you know, uh, what the companies themselves are disclosing. Obviously, you have 
you know, ESG reports. Uh, over 90% now of companies um, in the Russell 2000 here in the United States uh, publish ESG reports. The average ESG report is almost 200 pages long. Uh, some are 800 pages long. We've seen Chinese banks that have uh, ESG reports that are 1,500 pages long. Um, and so that's one company, one report. Now, you imagine trying to scale that to an entire portfolio. It might take you five years to read it all. And a lot of the data is still buried in the long reports. And so but you also want to know what the companies are doing. But many times, you want to know what the best practices are in the industry. So you might have a bank in your portfolio. You know, is that bank following all the best practices in terms of capital requirements and stress testing? What are the new regulations from a governance standpoint that are affecting the banking industry? So you can know what questions to ask that company. If it's a mining company, you might want to know what the best practices are in the mining industry for dealing with indigenous, indigenous communities, uh, dealing with you know labor rights and land rights in terms of where to build their mines. If it's an oil and gas company, you know, they also biodiversity issues. What are the right questions to ask? What are the best practices within that industry? But to know what the best practices are, you have to know what the entire industry is doing. Now. So you have to then be aware of, you know, um, out of you know many many hundreds of oil and gas companies, you know, what are they doing in these areas, and what are the leaders doing that should be emulated. On top of that, like I said, you have shareholder proposals, you have ESG webcasts now that are becoming standard uh, on Wall Street. You have ESG analysts asking these companies questions. What are the questions that are the, ears, the analysts that are asking your portfolio companies? What are the analysts concerned about from an ESG perspective? What are shareholders complaining about? What are you know, all the shareholder proposals? What are activist investors complaining about? And then on top of all that, what's in the news? Um, you know, you know, like knowing even what's authoritative in the news or what's the subset that is authoritative. So you can then identify what the most critical things are from a reputational standpoint, where the nexus is from reputational risk and ESG risk. Um, and then it, it's exacerbated further by the fact that many people don't even know what ESG is when you go into a deep level of analysis. So what are the ESG issues in the mining industry or in the chemicals industry? And oftentimes, when you're dealing with ESG data, they're no tags. It doesn't say that now I'm talking about biodiversity. You have to know about, you have to know that in this industry, this specific topic is a biodiversity topic. Or here, this issue is dealing with land rights. They might not even use the term land. So you have, you know, um, terminology issues, you have semantic issues. So when you put all that together, the data matrix is just so complex. And trying to do that, you know, across a portfolio of thousands of companies is next to impossible manually, especially with small teams. And then on top of that, you have multiple asset classes, not just equities, right? You might be looking at sovereign bonds, municipalities, and so forth. You want to do risk analysis and risk monitoring for your entire portfolio. Um, and so it's a very, very, very challenging problem to scale uh, and do the right amount of due diligence that it requires. Yeah, absolutely. And I can imagine, as you say, if you've got asset managers who have maybe two stewardship experts and they're having to whittle through these entire reports, go through that data, think about these questions and try and familiarise themselves with all of the different jargon out there, it's very overwhelming. So how does Weave AI kind of come into the picture then and help solve this problem and take the burden off? Yes. So, you know, um, and just to, to set the right context, this is a well-established problem. So, you know, like 92% of asset managers, you know, are prioritizing stewardship in a, in a Accenture survey. In addition, 84% say that AI and analytics are critical, um, not just, you know, nice to have, but that are absolutely critical to, the, to their stewardship efforts. So this is a very well-recognized challenge. What we do essentially is provide asset managers a dashboard that automates the entire workflow. Um, you know, of course, there's the you still need humans in the loop to so, so actually engage with the companies. To, to there's a qualitative judgment into on top of it, which the AI is never going to replace. But what the system does is takes away all the drudgery. So I can, you know, we can ingest portfolios and asset managers' portfolio, uh, and essentially, the system. Um, the first sort of step in the chain is risk monitoring. So I have thousands of portfolio companies as an asset manager. Which one should I focus on this quarter or this month? How do I go from many, many, many thousands of companies to the 50 
that are most pressing? How do I prioritize? The system does that for you. It says, look, these are the companies in your portfolio that have the most issues, whether it's legal issues, whether it's ESG issues. I can even look at the E, the S, and the G. I can look at it from different lenses. Are there, you know, are there, is that overlap between ESG risk for this set of companies and political risk or cyber risk and legal risk? Uh, so once you it then actually flags what those companies are, it ranks them, then it, it's actually a conversational experience. You can now say, okay, what's driving the ESG risk in within my portfolio? Are there patterns that you've seen? Are there patterns that you've seen from sector to sector? Uh, and so it actually knows what these ESG issues are, and it keeps up to date with these issues. It knows what the governance requirements are from one industry to the next, what the social issues are what is salient in the chemicals industry or in the food industry or in the mining industry or in oil and gas. It, it discuss, and it, these issues pop up all the time. It knows what the environmental issues are at great levels of depth. And so now, so you can now start having this conversational experience where you can, get, where you can start with your portfolio. It then whittles it down to say, look, these 100 companies or 50 companies or 20 companies have the most issues right now, and here's why. Okay, now you can find out these are the factors that are driving that risk. Okay, for these factors, which are the companies? So it's almost a back and forth, like you're having a conversation with an assistant. Uh, which companies are most at risk? And then you can then go and look at the data as to why the system did what it did. So we're not a ratings agency. This is actual data analytics, great levels of detail. So you can see the proof. Oh, this, this is there's something happening with this company here. We're seeing an issue here with labor unions. You know, we're seeing an issue here with unhappy employees. We're seeing an issue here with land rights for this mining company or whatever it is. Then the next issue is when you actually, when it helps you sort of narrow down the set of companies to focus on, you can then go in and analyze what the company is doing. And to do that, it actually automates the reading of these long reports. It actually reads the annual reports for you. It reads the ESG reports for you. It identifies what those companies are doing. What are the most material claims? It ranks the claims by materiality um, so that you can actually identify the 15%, according to BlackRock, of ESG disclosures that are material. But what's this company doing, right? And it guides you to ask questions. And then the last thing it does is says, look, it's going to tell you what the company is not doing, what they're not disclosing. It's going to say, look, look at this oil and gas company every other oil and gas company is making material investments in this particular area to tackle biodiversity loss. And this company is not doing anything. Now, maybe they're doing it, but they're not disclosing it, which in, which in itself uh, leads to transparency risk. So it actually guides you to ask all those interesting questions, illuminates what the company is doing and what they're not doing that they should be doing. And then it, just, then it shows you, I said, that's not enough, what the best practices are in the industry. It says, look, look at what oil and gas companies are doing in terms of biodiversity on this specific issue. These are the best practices. The company, this company did this, this company did this, this company did this, and this company in your portfolio is not doing anything. So then you have much more rich insights as an ESG stewardship analyst to go in there to engage with these companies in a much more meaningful way that saves your time, allows you to scale uh, scale your efforts. And again, this can apply to other asset classes. You can, in, we can look at, and we can give you risk, this risk radar, as we call it, for municip municipalities, for sovereigns, where you, you know, in terms of sovereign debt, where you have exposure on the fixed income side. Uh, and so it, it all, it's not just for equities. And so that's how the entire system comes together and allows you to have a small team and a large portfolio and go broad and deep, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, fantastic. I can see how it saves so much time identifying all those ESG related risks. When, as you say, they'll be different from every company, it will depend on the portfolio. So that itself is very, very useful and time saving. Um, when it comes to reporting then, so can asset man managers and stewardship teams take that data and those rankings that are generated, you know, kind of that customizable report and actually, you know, use it for their own reporting requirements? Or do they just take that really rich insight and kind of use it in a human way, as you say, to then feed into what they're doing when they're submitting their reporting? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so if you look at many of the stewardship codes right now and many of the, you know, so the stewardship codes are, so that there's the UK stewardship code by the FRC in the UK, the EU, Japan, uh, you know, many other, you know, countries have their own stewardship codes that the asset managers have signed up for. The UK stewardship code, um, over 200 asset managers have signed up for that. You also have, you know, issue specific stewardship uh, pledges. So like the finance for biodiversity pledge, for instance, was you know just sort of renewed last week at COP15. Um, so you have you know I think that's like over 120 asset managers that committed to that. Uh, and so many of these codes require you know the publishing of reports. You know and now the asset owners and clients are expecting these reports as well. And so typically you know they, they prescribe that you identify you 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 identify amongst your portfolio companies or, or asset classes what the issues are, what are the salient issues are across the board on an industry level, on a company level. Uh, and then you engage with the companies, but you demonstrate end to end how you engage, what the issues were, or what the com company did to mitigate uh, those issues uh, and what the ultimate outcome was. And normally it starts from engagement, you know, and then there's some sort of escalation if the company does not respond. And ultimately maybe there's a, there's, there's a proxy issue or an activist issue that eventually emits from that if there's no response. But that those stewardship codes now are very, very firm on sort of what they expect in terms of the level of detail in the reports. So absolutely, this can help you, um, uh, the, uh, your teams, uh, automate the identification of what these issues are. Now, like I said, the teams are still going to have to write the report, and, you know, but the system is now giving them much more data you know, um, to triage, to ask the right questions, uh, to engage with these companies, which which helps build um, much more uh, data input to make to make make for much richer stewardship reports. And ultimately, of course, that helps with the company in terms of branding, in terms of engaging with the your asset owners and being able to articulate to them how you are better managing uh, managing their money. So the, absolutely, this this feeds into the reporting side um, a, a, as well. That's great. It's very topical right now, as you say. Are we expecting any kind of significant updates from the stewardship codes in the next year or so? Do you know, or is this kind of it? Well, I think you know, like what a lot of it is just you know um, sharpening sort of the reporting requirements. If you go like, like year to year, I mean, like the UK code, the reporting requirements were dramatically uh, uh, sort of um, enhanced. Uh, in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, but a lot of it now is just, you know, asset managers are just signing up and and relying, re realizing that this, you know, those that don't do it, it's a competitive disadvantage in terms of attracting more more, more ESG capital. Uh, and this, you know, now this also applies to asset owners, you know, that are also signing up to the stewardship codes. So it's not just the asset managers, the asset owners as well, the pension funds and, and, and others are, are signing up, up, up as well. So the um, so like I said, you know the and you're having more of these issue related, um, you know uh, pledges and codes for, for biodiversity, uh, nature loss. Uh, you're going to have it for you know water stewardship and other issues. Many other standards groups are, are coming up with this. So you know having a small team trying to sort of manage all this across all these jurisdictions where the asset manager might be signing up for all these codes is really, really challenging. Uh, finding ESG talent is hard. Finding people that know about ESG is hard. So it's, you know, you know, AI and, and analytics are absolutely essential to, to be able to do this effectively and at scale. Yeah, I completely agree. And we've actually seen a lot of interest in stewardship at our events as well for our ESG um, New York conference in April. We've got a panel on stewardship, proxy voting and engagement, which has proven to be very popular. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from the, the asset managers themselves about what they've been doing and how they're struggling with their data or, you know, what their reporting systems are like. So obviously, we'll be looking forward to seeing you at our, our future events next year as well. So it's been great to have you back on the channel to, to round up 2022. So thanks, Nosa, for joining us. Thank you so much. On behalf of Weaver, I appreciate you joining me um, and listen, taking the time to listen to my uh, interview today and looking forward to hopefully seeing you all at uh, the event in New York in a few months and have a great holiday season, everyone. And Amy, thank you so much for the interview. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thanks everyone for watching.
All right, cheers. 